How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on Climate One, from opposite sides of the political spectrum, 350.org Executive Director May Booby and Tea Party co-founder Debbie Dooley come together and agree that renewable energy is good for America, despite the reluctance of the current administration. Plus, Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse joins us for a look at what his colleagues in Congress are doing to put the climate discussion back on the table. We're in the nation's capital, up next on Climate One. Record percentages of Americans are deeply concerned about global warming, according to a recent Gallup poll. More than 60% say it is caused by humans and is happening now. That concern was on display recently when tens of thousands of people marched on the National Mall calling for strong climate protection. President Trump has called global warming a hoax and filled his cabinet with people who deny or doubt the overwhelming scientific consensus that burning fossil fuels is causing temperatures and seas to rise. Most Republicans in Congress try to stay as far away as possible from this issue. Many Democrats, as well as corporations including IBM, Coca-Cola, Disney, General Electric, and Walmart, say climate is a serious risk to the economy and addressing it will create jobs and wealth. May Bouvi is executive director of 350.org, a grassroots organization that mobilizes people around the country and the world get for getting off fossil fuels. She's a former student of 350.org founder, author, and activist Bill McKibben. Debbie Dooley is president of Conservatives for Energy Freedom, a resident of Atlanta. She formerly served on the board of the Tea Party Patriots and is a co-founder of the Green Tea Coalition. Please welcome them to Climate One. Welcome to you both. Uh, Debbie Dooley, what's your vision for America in an era of global warming? Uh, envision that we remove the regulatory barriers that exist and allow energy to compete on a level playing field in the market. Uh, I fully and truly believe that moving to a decentralized power structure for example, rooftop solar is in our national security interests. So I, you know, I envision tens of millions of rooftop solar installations on homes. Uh, I envision sooner or later Republicans coming to grips with the fact that fossil fuel is damaging our environment. I don't see how they cannot believe that fossil fuel is causing damage to the environment. I see a world where left and right come together and we work together for a green energy revolution that is uh, enveloping our nation as we speak. 75% of Trump supporters like renewables, and they think we should do more to advance renewables. We need to look forward to innovation, to technology, to clean energy, and job creation. Well, if 75% of Trump yep. supporters support renewables, he's going in a different direction, trying to uh, drill off the coast, bring back coal. So is that upsetting to Trump supporters, or is it just not a high-priority issue for them? It's not a high-priority issue for most Trump supporters. And you have to understand, a lot of Republicans and conservatives don't like excessive regulation. They believe in competition and in choice, and, and that's something they believe in. They don't believe trying to regulate an industry out of business. But more and more people are embracing renewables. This is quite a change from the end of 2012, the beginning of 2013, when I first became a very strong clean energy advocate. People looked at me like I was from Mars. You're a conservative. You can't like clean energy. But I did. And I, I do think uh, one of the things, I spoke at, spoke at Bloomberg's event, and I t said, made this statement on the record, that I did not believe President Trump was going to pull out of the Paris Accord because it would be bad for business. 
And I, I mean, the genie's out of the bottle. It's not going to be put back in. I mean, clean energy will continue to flourish. Even conservatives are embracing it. And that was a poll that was taken in November that showed only 25% of Trump supporters believed in climate change, but 75% thought the nation should do more to advance renewables. May Booby, uh, how does that compare with your vision for, uh, you're a very different place politically, but how does what you just heard compare with your vision for energy in America in a hot world? It does seem pretty clear that the belief that renewable energy is what we need, not only in this country, but around the world, is shared. More and more every day we're hearing this, that that consensus <laughs> is getting stronger. And there's just so much evidence that people are seeing their own economic development tied to the transition yeah. off of fossil fuels. So I think that is where we have room to build. And I think that belief is uniting people across political divides, across all the divides we see in our movements. So in that sense, I think there's a lot to work from. A lot of our work is focused on how quickly can we accelerate the transition off of fossil fuels. Because what we know about climate change is that it's already happening much faster than anyone expected. Our top scientists are horrified when they look at their own models, they look at the evidence, and they see what's taking place. So our concern is that the fossil fuel interests are standing in the way of that progress, and it's, it's their impact on the political process that we're contending with. So that is why we see people mobilizing in the streets. There are countless mobilizations of people who are trying to move this forward. That's, I think, where the challenge comes, is that we do see a very strong role for government in bringing that transition about, because the scale of change required is so massive that it's hard to imagine doing that without the role of government. And second, one of the things that we really believe in is that this is a movement for everybody. It's got to be a deeply inclusive movement across the lines that have historically divided us on race, on gender, sexual orientation, sexual identity, all the things that make us who we are. We're all part of that movement. And so that's the other place where I think we need to be building something together. And if we can do that, and we can do that through renewable energy, sign me up. Yep. David Dooley, you nodded your head when May Boovey said inclusive. Uh, yep. The brown economy left a lot of people behind. It affected communities of color who lived closest to the refineries and factories. They breathe the dirtiest air. Do you think the green economy should address some of those people who were hurt in the brown economy? I do. Uh, what I would love to see happen is for a lot of the renewable companies to build factories or plants in West Virginia and Kentucky and put coal miners that are out of work, put them to work in the renewable energy field. And, and this is a field that is growing and it's growing stronger. But yes, I think renewable should be open to everyone. And I do know there are some programs in Kentucky and West Virginia where they're actually, the solar industry is actually training uh, out-of-work coal miners in the solar industry field. And I think that's something that needs to happen. If this makes so much sense and there's jobs, then, then uh, it sounds like there's more action at the state level than the federal level, then why is there this gridlock in, the, in Congress where there's, uh, by one recent count, 180 members of Congress who deny climate change, 142 in the House, 38 in the Senate. They've accepted $82 million from fossil fuel yes. companies. Is that related? <laughs> I think that's very related. And I can tell you from my work in the states under the Obama administration, even though he was very pro-renewables, I was fighting battle after battle after battle on the state level. And a lot of that money what I saw happening is something that's a very dangerous trend as far as I, I'm concerned in renewables is that you saw these fossil fuel companies joining forces with these electric utility monopolies to stop competition from renewables. You have to understand one thing. People say, well, why would these electric utilities do that? They make a guaranteed profit every time they have to build a new power plant. So they want to keep on having to build new power plant. And in Florida, I mean, Koch Brothers funded groups. They're horrible. I don't like, you know, I'm not fond of Koch Brothers or their groups in any way because I've had experience with them actually lying outright lying and distorting the facts. And some of the very same people 
that are these groups like Heartland and Competitive Enterprise Institute that are saying man is not damaging the environment and renewables are bad. In the 1990s, these same groups were taking money from big tobacco to convince Americans secondhand smoke posed no health risk. If they lied to us once, why should we believe anything they say? May Boovey, a lot of movements are built on villainizing, sort of attacking people. Um, do you think we need some more empathy sometimes for people that work in those industries rather than making them bad people, which makes it hard to accept your message? I do think more movements based on empathy is essential. I also think that when the climate movement started to focus on the fossil fuel industry was when we started to win. Because I think up until that movement, up until that moment, we were focused on only individual actions that people can take. You know, if you bike more to work, if you compost, if you buy a Prius, not only were these only reaching a certain portion of the population, they were never going to address the problem at the scale that we have to. So when we started acting like a social movement where we, there were heroes and real villains, I think we've really demonstrated that's where I think there's a lot of alignment actually is the disastrous role the industry is playing. So I think that has been really important. And I think that's different than being unempathetic. I think it's about speaking truth to power and revealing something about our politics that is resulting in catastrophic climate change. This is Climate One from the Commonwealth Club. I'm Greg Dalton. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome. Um, one of the problems is that a lot of people in the environmental groups and especially left-leaning environmental groups don't want to acknowledge that for Republicans to get on board, there can't, there can't be um, keeping of revenue or growing of government. And I, I just think that that needs to happen. We, we can't just have more Democratic sponsored bills with no Republicans on board. It makes no sense. Thank you. May Boovey, it's true that a lot of the politicians who want to solve climate see revenue streams to fund their favorite projects to address the problem and address environmental injustice. It's happening in California. There's lots of money flowing. Uh, but are you willing to give up that possibility of revenue for a revenue neutral where it doesn't grow government? I guess I want to flip the conversation a little bit and focus on how do we have enough political power to get the legislation we actually need? And like that's what our work is. We don't really do that much work in Washington. We try to build movements so that we can actually demand what we need. And we are so far away from that right now. But the fight over the Keystone Pipeline, that wasn't really a policy fight. That was a fight about building power. It was about getting the president to acknowledge that you cannot expand fossil fuel infrastructure. And when Obama made that decision, no other head of state had ever made a decision to cancel a major piece of infrastructure because of climate change. And that was because our movement was powerful. I bet a lot of people in this room got arrested over the Keystone fight or visited Obama at a campaign rally. So, so that is what we work on. And we don't pretend to be every part of the climate movement. I mean, we're the mobilizers, right? That, that's what we help to contribute. And thank goodness for Citizens Climate Lobby and the groups that work on policy and try to build those coalitions because we need everybody doing this. And I'm going to go now talk with U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Great to be, thank you for being here. Good to be with you. So, I don't dare move from my mark, so you've got to reach for me. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just heard from a co-founder of the Tea Party and 350.org, one of the most uh, organized environmental organizations. Were you a little surprised by what you just heard, the far left and far right talking? Well, you know, it goes all the way back to the Sierra Club and the Tea Party in Atlanta successfully beating back the big utilities who were trying to get taxes to their benefit for solar on the roofs of homes. And the uh, Sierra Club folks were against that because it was not in the interests of a clean environment, and the Tea Party people were against that because they didn't want to have stuff on their homes taxed, and they made the original Green Tea Coalition. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that should prevent 350.org and the Tea Party from getting together because there is nothing in Tea Party doctrine that says we're really happy when a big industry can take over our United States government and run it for its own benefit, paying no attention to the wishes or the welfare of the people. That's not in anybody's interest except the industry in question. 
So we see uh, the left and the right getting together in Georgia and, and other places. How about uh, at, at your workplace? Is that happening uh, in the U.S. Senate? Because uh, 10 years ago, Barack Obama and John McCain were basically in the same place yeah. on climate change when they both ran for president. Now things are further apart. I got elected in 2006. I was sworn in in 2007. For all of 2007, 2008, and 2009, while I was in the Senate, there were multiple bipartisan climate change bills to regulate the emissions of carbon dioxide. And in that period, the Republican candidate for president, you mentioned John McCain, ran, carried his party's banner into that presidential election on a great climate change platform. Then came January of 2010. And in January of 2010, five justices on the Supreme Court gave the fossil fuel industry and other big industries the biggest prize that has ever been given out in American politics, which is the ability to spend unlimited amounts of money in politics. You mentioned the 80-some million dollars that has gone to members of Congress. That is the tiniest tip of the iceberg. The big thing in Congress is the ability to spend unlimited money, and with that comes the ability to threaten to spend unlimited money. So what the fossil fuel industry has done is gone to the Republican Party, they've picked their target, and they've said, anybody who crosses us on climate change, we will take you out. Mm -hmm. And they have a credible threat, uh, as demonstrated by a Republican congressman named Bob Inglis, who they, in fact, took out. So when you've got an industry saying, we have the ability to spend unlimited amounts of money to crush you, and we will do so if you dare cross us, that's much worse than... $80 million in reported money that's floating around. That's not good, but that's not as bad as the threats. A lot of town halls recently, Republicans have been challenged on climate change publicly in a way that they haven't been recently. Do you think that will cause some movement? Uh, Daryl Issa is a very conservative member of Congress from San Diego. Yep. He recently joined a caucus in Congress, the Climate Solutions Caucus. He, lost a, he won a very competitive race. Uh, do you think that that public pressure in these town halls is moving any of the members? Public pressure is moving them, but so is the pressure of facts around them. Uh, Representative Crabello represents the Keys down in Florida. He's a Republican. If you live in the Keys down in Florida, you are having a harder and harder time finding fresh water. As the sea encroaches, it pushes counterpressure against the underlying fresh water, and it makes it hard to find. If you live in the Keys, you're looking at foreseeable circumstances not too far from now when your house is going to be underwater. You have the Republican mayor of that county planning for these near-catastrophic eventualities. So if you're going to represent that district, you can't pretend this is not real. Everybody knows you're lying. So that pressure is also working on some members of Congress who are Republican. But it's easy to talk a cheap talk and sign on to a resolution that says, I'm a Republican and I think we should do something. Mm -hmm. None of them yet have crossed the Rubicon to say, here's a bill I'll actually support that is meaningful in addressing climate change. If you look at the Republicans outside of Congress who aren't under the same political pressure from the fossil fuel industry because they don't have an election upcoming in which unlimited money can be spent against them, virtually every Republican who has looked at climate change and thought it through to a solution has come to the same solution. And that solution is a price on carbon that makes the market work and that is revenue neutral, meaning you don't grow government with it. You take all the revenue that it raises and you push it back to the public. And I think on the Democratic side, our answer to that is yes, we will be happily go there. But I think the best place to target a solution is where virtually every Republican points right now. Two former uh, Republican Secretary of the Treasury, uh, uh, James Baker, yeah, George Baker, Schultz, Schultz and, Paulson. and Paulson, came to Washington, presented a plan. Uh, is that a little bit like Grandpa coming to town? You have to give them some respect, but don't have to do what they say? Well, until they have unlimited money to spend and they can say to a Republican senator, hey, I know those fossil fuel guys are going to come after you, but I promise you I'm well-resourced too and I will have your back. That's the conversation that will break this gridlock, and that's the conversation that is not yet happening. You look at good companies, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Google, Walmart, Unilever, you can go through a whole list of companies in America that have terrific climate policies. They don't lift a collective finger in Congress. They have given up on Congress, and they have given the fossil fuel industry free reign 
to bully and terrorize around the building. Nobody pushes back. It's really embarrassing for America's corporate leadership. And have you asked them, why don't you weigh in on climate? Because they certainly tell their customers they're, they're on that side. They say they're scared. The, dis the, 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 the confluence between fossil fuel interests and the Republican Party in Congress has gotten so great that they don't know where the boundary is any longer. And if you're Apple, you're worried about hiding your revenues offshore in Ireland, and you don't want Speaker Ryan to come after you on your offshore revenues, you want to be left alone on that, so you say virtually nothing in Congress about climate change. And if you're Coca-Cola, you have issues making sure there's never going to be a soda tax. So you say nothing about climate change in Congress, even though your website's terrific, your policies are terrific, and you're even trying to influence your own supply chain. So if you put a sign up over Congress that said, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, that is what corporate America sees. And I guess my message today would be, you shouldn't think that way. You know, there's safety in numbers. And the group of big American corporations that came together to support President Obama in Paris made a difference. They could make the same difference if they'd get together and come to Washington and say to Republicans, we will have your back. We know what the bad guys are going to do. We will have your back. John McCain is a hell of a brave man. He does not need to know that he's going to win before he'll get into a fight. But he doesn't sign up for suicide missions either. Our thanks to, uh, Republic, to Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Thank you. Good yes. to be with you. Thank you. Well We're going to go to our lightning round and ask you a series of quick questions. Okay. I'm going to ask you, uh, name something, say a phrase, uh, and get your first unfiltered response to that. And then we'll go to true or false. Debbie Dooley, EPA, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt. I'm not real fond of him. <laughs> okay. May Boovey, Energy Secretary Rick Perry. On the wrong side of history. <laughs> May Boovey, Ivanka Trump. Don't believe a word of it. True or false, May Bovey, overall, the Tea Party has had a negative impact on American politics by pushing the country to the right and denigrating the legitimate role of government. True. Sorry, Debbie. Uh, <laughs> Debbie Dooley, uh, true or false, Russian interference in the 2016 election casts a cloud over the legitimacy of Donald Trump's presidency. Absolutely false. They didn't make me cast my vote. Debbie Dooley, Al Gore once called you his friend. That is true. He is my friend. Um, true or false, May Boovey, you like Debbie Dooley more than you thought you would. True. <laughs> <laughs> Last one for Debbie Dooley. Uh, you'd like to have a few mint juleps with May Boovey on the porch and get to know her. I don't know about mint juleps, but something alcoholic, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that ends our lightning round. Let's give them a, a round of thanks for uh, getting to that. Hey, Booby, coming here today, were you a little bit reluctant, anxious about sitting down with a Tea Party person? Not sure what you're going to get? Yeah, I was. And I think what we're trying to grapple with right now is, and we haven't talked a whole lot about Donald Trump yet in this conversation, and we cannot underscore the devastating impact that he's having in this country. And so that's what worried me, is that I think he has so torn apart the fabric of our democracy, and I think so many people are afraid for their future in this country because of his presidency, people who are refugees seeking shelter, people who are immigrants living in this country, women who have lost access to rep reproductive care. And so this is our movement. You know, climate change is not uh, an issue per se. It's something that affects us all. And so in thinking about this conversation in places where I know there are divisions, um, I'm interested in thinking about how do we actually talk about those, those places where there is not agreement. Because fortunately, Mother Nature is doing the job for us in terms of convincing people about climate change. And the economy is doing our job for us when it comes to renewables. But what about the rest of us? What about uh, rebuilding our democracy?
And I'll have to disagree about Donald Trump because I, you know, have, I don't agree with a lot of stuff that he says, especially, you know, renewables and climate change, but I do think he can be convinced uh, to promote renewables based on innovation, based on job creation. For me, this earth is not a Republican earth or a Democrat Earth. It's not a conservative or liberal Earth. So we may disagree on 85% of the issues, but we owe it to future generations of the world, to our great-grandchildren and grandchildren to work together to protect this Earth and to lead when it comes to renewables. The United States should not let China lead when it comes to renewables. We should be the ones out there leading. We have to wrap it up. We've been talking about the changing politics of climate change. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guest today were May Bouvie, Executive Director of the Environmental Group 350.org, and Debbie Dooley, President of Conservatives for Energy Freedom and a co-founder of the Tea Party Movement. We also heard from U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island. We recorded this show at the Museum in Washington, D.C. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows recorded with a live audience are available wherever you podcast. When you download one, please leave a comment and give us a rating. We want to know what you think of our conversations about energy, food, water, technology, psychology, and everything climate. Climate One is the sustainability project of the Commonwealth Club of California. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you.